God. <laughs> Welcome, I'm Lois Siegel, and we're so happy to have you here this evening. I know there were a lot of things going on, so I'm really pleased for the turnout. So thank you for coming. Um, as many of you know, the Howard J. Siegel Leadership Development Institute began in 2013 to honor my late husband. I have been asked several times why I said yes to giving his name to this program. It's very simple. Howard cared so dearly about his philanthropy, the community, and who would be its future leaders. So when asked, I knew this was the way to go to honor his legacy. I'm thrilled that you all come this evening. Thank you for making this commitment. I know how proud Howard would have been that you chose to continue in sharing his work to make our community great. This program is jointly presented by the Jewish Federation, the Jewish Leadership Academy, the Howard J. Siegel Leadership Institute, and it's open to the entire community and is designed for both new and veteran leaders. Before I introduce tonight's presenter, I want to thank Lisa Fishman, who is there, <laughs> and Alan Rosenberg, who could not be here tonight. And I thank them both for co-chairing these programs. It means a great deal to me to have both of you honor Howard in this way. Our topic is tonight is, so you've had a great meeting, now what? Mastering the Art of the Follow-Up. Our presenter, Arlene Schiff, is the National <coughs> Director of the Life and Legacy Program at the Harold Greenspoon Foundation, where she provides training and supports communities across North America to secure meaningful after-lifetime legacy gifts. Prior to joining the foundation, Arlene served as the executive director of the Jewish Federation of the Berkshire. During her 12-year tenure, she provided visionary leadership while devising and executing strategic plans that centered on community building and garnering support for philanthropic giving. Arlene is a graduate of the University of Massachusetts and holds an MA from Harvard University. Arlene, welcome to Hartford, and we're excited to have you here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here, and um, I look forward to an active conversation around the whole concept of donor stewardship. Um, so I was told that last time you had a presenter who talked about how to have the conversation. And now we wanted to discuss what you do after you've had that conversation. So a little bit about my program just before I get started. So you have some reason why I'm standing here before you. So I run the Life and Legacy Program for the Harold Grinspoon, Grinspoon Foundation. Um, we're working to build organizational endowments through after lifetime giving. And um, we started the program in 2012 with seven communities across North America, and we're now in 58 communities and growing. Um, and as a result of the work that Harold um, has invested in, we've helped uh, 52 communities secure over 22,000 legacy gifts with uh, almost a billion dollars in future value, uh, 94 million of which has been already been put in the back. So a huge part of legacy giving is stewardship, right? I just turned 60 a few weeks ago. I hope to live another 30 years. That's a long time to keep me connected, engaged, feeling appreciated, so I don't change my will. Um, and so organizations continue to be in it. And so we've spent a lot of time working with organizations across the country on this concept of stewardship. I just want you to turn to the, someone near you and tell them one thing that you hope 
that you will learn um, in this session, just so I get a sense of the kinds of things that you're looking to learn and make sure that we cover them. So just take one second, turn to the person, introduce yourself if you don't know them, and uh, tell me one thing that you're looking to learn. <laughs> I've been calling for 
for so long. I know that they're, some of them are getting on in years. Uh, they're not 60 years old or beyond that. And I have started to ask uh, about legacy. And I, I find out that uh, the money isn't necessarily going to the Jewish uh, causes, but it is going to different causes. And uh, I can't argue with them. But no, accept, absolutely not. Yes. I just accept their uh, generous willingness to communicate with me in that regard. But I think it is knowing that you're in the community and seeing these people all the time mm -hmm. uh, cements that relationship. It's actually the depth of the relationship. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've had to know them for 30 years, no. but you have to know something about them, right? Okay, anybody else? Hopefully we'll hit all those topics, but if not, someone will remind me, so we make sure to do it at the end. Is there a way to turn off these first two lights? Would that be <laughs> <laughs> Just I'll try. It looks kind of, it looks kind yeah, of yeah. Uh, washed out. Um, so just a few definitions. Thank you, that's it, thank you. Um, so cultivation is the process of engaging a donor to the point where they're willing to make that financial commitment. Recognition is the point of honoring them, right? Privately or publicly honoring them. But stewardship is, at least the way I define it, is the ongoing care of donors and the funds that they've contributed, right? So it's not that I gave to the annual campaign once and I get that one thank you note and you're done with me until the next time you want to call me and ask for money. It's really how do I show our appreciation and gratitude, keep people engaged, show them that they made a good investment um, so that they'll want to remain committed and giving over and over and over again, right? So it's about appreciation, it's about gratitude, but it's also about further engaging me um, and when I give you money, I want to know that I've made a good investment, whether I give it to you now or whether I decide to leave it to you at another time. I need to know that the money I'm giving is having an impact. Because people don't want to just give money if it's not going to make a difference in the community. So I want you to think about a time that you made a donation to something and you're you did not feel appreciated or the, the, you made it and their response left you very flat. And if you're willing to share without naming the organization, I'd like to hear a few stories. So anybody give and just... Oh, okay. So when you are involved with an institution for a long time and you give annual gifts and then you don't hear from them and you know everybody around you is kind of saying oh did so and so call you did so and so call you and nobody does oh I think that's like a big one that is a huge one yes you were shaking your head so I'm just I, I have had one um, once where you know we, we made at the time what we thought was things and you know and then um and then soon after, like we got a call again and said we never made that gift. Okay, so you gave a gift and you thought it was significant, but they called you again without even acknowledging that the first gift didn't thank yeah, you. So, and, so hmm. their back records were yes, the back records. The process. So I, my story is I was a donor to the United Way, um, and I would make my own gift, and my husband would make his own gift. And my thank you note always came to Arlene and Gary Schiff. Even though it was my own gift, and he was in the database to make his own gift. His gift came to Mr. Gary Schiff. My thank you note always came to Arlene and Gary Schiff. And I would tell them year after year after year, and it was always, there's a lot of turnover, we're sorry, we're sorry, a lot of turnover. Um, that was just one of many, many things. So can you think about a time where you, you did make a contribution and you felt good about it because of the response you got from the organization. Anybody have a story to share? Okay, 
I would just say whenever I get a personal handwritten note, okay. it makes a big difference. Absolutely. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. That is the number one thing that donors say um, gets them to be definitely loyal and to give more and more money each time is a personalized handwritten note. You have some we did the project and six months later out of the blue we did a whole video about it and that was really like it meant a lot it gave us a piece of a tool that we could share because it took place in some public house uh -huh. and we were able to share it all also that's right so that that's above and beyond that's even my next my next slide which is thinking about an organization that like went over the top right because that's who we want to be we want our organization to be the one that donors say, oh my gosh, they treated me so well, I'm gonna to continue to give to them year after year after year. One of my colleagues gave to a, one of these national wildlife uh, organizations, $50 she gave them, and she got a voice message on her phone from the executive director thanking her for that $50 gift. And she said, she would continue to give to that organization forever because the executive director took, you know, two minutes to call them and leave them a message. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm just thinking out of everything I give, I think the most important thing I give back is when there's a note from people who are helping you know, with the camp. Uh -huh. uh -huh. the, uh, uh, so hearing directly from the beneficiaries. Yeah. Hearing directly from the beneficiaries. Yeah, we're going to see a video that relates to that in a little while. But really thinking about, um, I was in Richmond and this gentleman told a story of how his father, when his mom passed away, his father um, set up an endowment at the library at the university that she went to. And every year the library sends them a list to the books that they bought with the money from the endowment. Well, now it's been 20 years and he got the most beautiful letter listing all the books that that endowment has purchased for that library over 20 years. And he said it was so meaningful to him that he too will continue to put money into that endowment because he saw it was making a difference. They report back to him. They let him know he's making a difference. And he knows that his mom's name is living on because of the gifts. So again, that's what we're striving for. We want to be that one organization. We don't want to be the United Way where I stopped, I stopped giving. You know, after 30 years, I finally got fed up. We want to be the organization that makes us feel really, really good, makes people feel really, really good. So they want to stay connected, engaged, and give their ultimate gift, whatever that most major gift is that they can um, over the course of their life. So stewardship is really that ongoing care, right? It's what we do to, with, and for a donor before and after the gift. It's an investment in the next gift. The better, you know, the way we treat people is what's going to lead to either them giving more or less or not at all, right? And we want to further engage. The goal of stewardship is to further engage our donors so they continue giving, they increase their giving, and that they become indefinitely loyal to you. So Maya Angelou said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Right? And that's what we want to strive for. We want to be that organization that people remember who made them feel really, really good. And when we do uh, good stewardship, there's a whole cycle, right? People will give regularly, they'll give to priorities, they'll give to their maximum capacity, they'll agree to participate, they'll bring others along, they'll help us spread the message because they feel so good about their engagement with us. So turn to someone near you and share how maybe one or two things that your organization currently does to steward your donors. <laughs> They're all dead. Cemetery? No, your donors aren't dead. Their families are still alive, right? Your customers. 
um, and to be that organization that people will remember. So this woman, Penelope Burke, she does the largest donor survey um, in the United States and Canada, and she's been doing it for years. And so she asked on one of the survey forms, once you've made a first gift to a nonprofit, what would cause you to be indefinitely loyal and give at an increasingly uh, generous level? And these are the four things that donors said. They want to receive that prompt, thank you note, acknowledgement of their gift, prompt, key there, prompt. Um, if they want to designate their gift, they want the ability to designate. Uh, they want to know that you report, you're reporting back to them, you're showing them the impact their gifts are having, and they want that personalized thank you note. Um, that handwritten thank you note is very, very important. Or if you're writing a, sending a form letter to make sure that you at least write a personal note on that form letter. So during your conversation, while you're having that great conversation, it's the perfect opportunity for you to find out more about me, to find out why and when I made my first gift. What is it about the organization that I care about? You know, what do I hope to see in the Jewish community in the future? Why, why am I giving this money now? Uh, what is the most meaningful experience I've had? Really trying during that conversation to build a relationship with me and to make it less of Arlene, would you give another hundred dollars or last year you gave X, we're asking everyone to increase by Y and really understanding why I've been giving and why I want to give. And the more you understand that, the better steward you can be. Because if I say I believe in Jewish education, it's what I think is most important for the Jewish community, then you'll know to invite me or put a little uh, post-it note on a flyer about something that's happening related to Jewish education or to invite me to the day school's graduation or a play that one of the Hebrew schools are doing. The more you get to know me during that great conversation, the better steward you'll be able to be. Now, yes, not every organization has the capacity to steward every donor personally, but you do want to try as time goes on to periodically do something special for those donors who are giving you the largest amount or who are the most engaged. So stewardship is many things. It's acknowledging and recognizing your donors. It's making sure your database is up to date and you have an efficient back office that those thank you notes aren't going out six months from now, but they're going out in a week from the time, you know, within a week. Um, we try within our program to get them out within two days, especially if it's a handwritten note that doesn't have to have any tax information or on it or anything. You can get that out very quickly. You want to obviously be financial, financially stable and show me that you're using my money in a responsible way. And then the whole point of stewardship is to further engage because the more connected and engaged I am, the more likely I'm, I'm going to give more money. So this is a chart that we came up with in my program, um, and we talk about a minimum of four touches. Um, whether that is exactly the right amount or not, this is what we propose. We propose that donors get at least one thing delivered to them personally at home. So if they never step into your facility, um, they're at least being touched by you once a year. And we recommend more than four, but a minimum of four. So that can be the thank you note. That can be a thank you phone call, which we'll talk about in a minute. It can be the birthday card or a holiday card. It can be a personal letter. It can be a mini meaningful gift, Michelle Mano at Purim or something for Passover or seeds at Tu Bishvat. Um, it can be a video, which we'll talk about, and it can be an impact report. So something I get at home that helps me show that you appreciate me, that keeps me connected and engaged. Yes. I uh, think about some of the organizations here. Some of them have a good time development. You kind of lead the charge a lot of it. I mean, they do all the work. But they certainly try and make sure that it's parcel out and trying to keep it. On the other hand, congregations, for the most part, don't have so my question to you is, who does all this? 
So uh, in my program, we have a team, right? We have a legacy team, and it's made up of one professional and the rest lay leaders, and many of the congregations is totally lay led. So you have a stewardship committee, just like you have a fundraising committee, you should be having a stewardship committee to thank people. It doesn't have to be the same people. There's plenty of people in organizations who don't want to go out there and ask people for money, but they'd be happy to write a thank you note or make a thank you phone call. So there's plenty of people. At my federation, every month after my annual campaign, my boards of directors would get 10 names, and I would say, please call these 10 people over the next month and just thank them for giving to the campaign. So it doesn't have to be a staff person at all. But I mean, we need people, but, and I know even that's an issue today in finding volunteers, but stewardship is a fun thing for people to do. Um, so it's usually easy to find people who are willing to do the stewardship, but you have to make it a priority. It has to be part of the organizational culture. Um, so donor listings and testimonials, if you're running a campaign, listing your donors periodically so they can see that they're part of this group um, who stepped up to do whatever, either um, capital campaign or an endowment campaign or an annual campaign, whatever it is. And then also debt donor testimonials, telling the stories of those donors, asking somebody, why did you give to X. And all you have to do for a testimonial is a picture and a quote. I gave to the Federation's annual campaign because. Like these things honor the person for giving, but they also serve to help you market because people see who else is doing it and they say, oh, I feel the same way. Maybe I should do that too. So it's both stewardship, it's honoring the person who, who gave the gift, but it's also a great way to market. Um, having an event once a year for those donors, whether it's um, an annual campaign or a capital campaign or a Torah campaign or whatever it is, bringing them together once a year to be with the other people who stepped up and gave to that particular cause. Donors like those, and we'll talk about more about that in a minute. And then recognizing people at, and I call it a community, but whatever your organizational gathering is, either at an annual meeting or um, a gala or a legacy, I say legacy Shabbat because that's what we have in my program. Anything that you want to do um, when your community comes together to recognize the people who step forward amongst everybody else. So they're honored for having uh, given. And a lot of times it can be as simple as um, putting a special designation on their name tag or having them wear a special ribbon, um, whatever. It doesn't have to be making a big deal about it, but just recognizing and honoring them. I was going to say, and you said four touches per year, one in each category. That's what we recommend. If I mean, if there was more than one person, is, is that getting to be too much? Or? I, I don't think you can thank people enough. Okay, um, you know, so we'll have people who send the handwritten thank you note, then two weeks later they make the thank you call, then, you know, six months later they're sending out an impact report. Uh, the person, yeah, yeah. yeah, right, the personal touch, you can definitely do more than once. But again, talking to capacity, you want to think about what can you actually do and and think about activities that you can integrate into your organizational calendar, right? So you want to try to think of things that can continue in perpetuity, even if the rabbi leaves or the executive director leaves or the development director leaves, because we don't want that stewardship to stop, right? It can't be reliant on one person. It has to be part of your organizational culture. So uh, personal touches, the handwritten notes, the phone calls, personal notes on a flyer if something's coming up and you think it would be of extra interest to a particular donor, say, please join me at this event. Um, I once a year would do a, a impact report um, for all my major donors. They just get a letter that sort of shared with them the impact that their gifts were having in the community. They got my newspaper 10 times a year. 
but this way, all in one place, they could see what the major impact in the community was. Inviting donors to events not open to the public. If you're having a play at a religious school or an event in someone's house, or just thinking of things that they might enjoy that they might not go to if they don't normally have a kid, a kid in the school, but they believe in Jewish education and they're supporting the school. We're not looking for you to plan another whole gala or anything like that. It should be something that's easy to do. And a lot of these events to honor your legacy donor or your, sorry, comes out of my mouth automatically. To honor your annual donors is to do something 45 minutes before another program. If you're bringing in a guest speaker that's open to the community or to your congregation, have the um, annual donors come and have a tea and cookie or wine and cheese 45 minutes earlier and get to meet the speaker. So you're not adding a whole new event to your organizational calendar, but you're building upon something that you're already doing. You're just giving the um, donors that you're honoring a little extra attention during that event. Uh, some ideas about great thank you notes. So Penelope Burke uh, also wrote a book called Donor-Centered Fundraising. And it has some of these tips. She said 45% of donors have given again because of a great thank you letter, and 23% have made a larger gift. Okay, so these personal notes really do make a difference to people. Um, so really, if you can, write a handwritten note rather than a printed note, making sure it's addressed to Arlene, not dear friend. I even saw something that in her book where she said it's not good to cross out, I used to do this at my federation, I'd cross out dear friend and write in the person's name. She said, even that's not good because they know that it was a mass mailing and you know that's not good enough anymore. Um, you wanna focus on the donor, not the gift, have it be uh, warm. You know, So again, if it has to be a type letter, okay, but try to write it as if it was a handwritten note um, and no spelling or grammatical errors and issue promptly. Penelope says less than two weeks, she recommends the letter go out in one. Thank you phone calls. So only about a third of donors say they receive thank you phone calls. So if you can start doing this, it'll make your organization stand out. Um, people said that, uh, about a third of the people said that receiving a call led them to give again. And 21% said they gave more generously. And Stats show that even you don't have to talk to me. You can leave a message on my machine or my voicemail on my phone, and it's as impactful as if we actually had the conversation. So you can tell people, please call the following people, and they don't have to call me 10 times because I don't pick up my phone because I don't recognize the number. They can leave a message, and the donor will feel just as appreciated from that message. Um, Penelope recommends thank you calls within 60 days of making a gift. I, I would recommend that you do it sooner if you have the capacity to do so. By two months from now, I might have forgotten that I even made the gift, right? So um, the sooner the better. And then reporting your impact. Um, this is just one example of a JFS, a one-page way of showing donors the difference that their gifts are making. Um, so at the top, it talks about because of you, right? You is the glue that pulls people in. So anytime you write to me, you want to use that word you as often as you can. Um, talking about the number of people you serve. In this case, they do a lot with numbers. Um, for some donors, numbers work. For other donors, hearing a story is more impactful. I used to run a kosher hot meal program. For some people, I would say, okay, I, um, I would tell them, I serve 5,000 kosher hot meals, and they would think that was a huge impact. For other people, it was much more impactful for them to hear me tell them that. Right? Anne and Joe, every year, would write me a letter and say, thank you so much for those uh, home-delivered meals. Because of you, we got to stay in our own home for another year, and we never expected that to happen, right? So hearing that story for many people is more impactful. So you, in most of your things, you would want to do both stories and statistics because different people connect in different ways. 
Um, and then in this case, you always want to have a call to action because we don't want them to think work is done and we don't need their money anymore, right? So we want to always be able to say, thank you for helping us get to this point, but here's how you can continue to help. To help. Now, even synagogues, this is a synagogue impact report, uh, one of the few that I found. Um, it says, how do we measure our success? by creating profound connections. And so they are listing the variety of ways that congregants can connect to their, um, to the, the congregation. Um, and so even synagogues can show their impact. Synagogues probably don't always think about in those terms, but you are making a difference in people's lives and sharing that and reminding people of the difference you make is going to get them to continue to give and to make sure that that, um, experience that they've had is available for future generations, right? So they'll want to continue to keep that going. Again, this is very heavy in numbers. If it was me, I would mix it up with some numbers and some stories. So video now, because we all have iPhones, is a very easy way to show impact. And we're going, I'm going to show you one video um, and then part of one um, in a minute. But according to Penelope Burke again, only 5% of donors have ever received a thank you video. 81% of them actually viewed it. So when they got it in their email, 81% actually opened it, which is a very high rate. And 50% of donors who viewed it said that it influenced them to give again. This isn't queued up, right, Heather? Uh, no, it is not. Okay. Penelope Burke said, of all the videos that she's seen, this is one that she highly recommends. We won't show the whole thing because it's long, but I just want to give you a taste of it. Um, and then uh, when we send you the PowerPoint, if you decide you want to watch the whole thing, you can. Hello, Dr. Dona. My name is Dr. Pfeiffer. I come from Kansas, where um, no one is in medicine. My dad worked for a factory. So, I'm here to unpack her. Thank <laughs> you. 
Penelope liked about that is that she's talking directly to the donor. Even if you're not Dr. Deno, you can feel, right? So uh, she's talking directly at you. Um, and it's very, it's a very personal thing. And so trying to get a video that connects with donors on in that personal level, I think is why Penelope thought this was a great video. I haven't watched the whole thing. So I, I don't know if I can, can I just say sure, that sure. at the end? Yeah. Um, the doctor was just so impressed. The gentleman was so impressed who gave him the scholarship, to pay for the scholarship money that he paid for all of her tuition. And he was so moved by that. And it was making me think about how easy it is to um, be able to do something like that. Now, of course, it's finding a recipient who's willing to, willing to do that. But, you know, I'm looking at it as a donor to anything, that impact is definitely, um, I can see why she did it. And I, I think that even if you weren't Dr. Denim, but you got that, yeah. it would move you to <laughs> say, right. you know, giving a scholarship to University of Michigan to help their kids go to medical school has a huge impact on people's lives, right? So whether it's the camper or something larger, the videos are very impactful and you know not everybody's doing them so again if you have the ability to do it and it doesn't have to be very long and you can email it out to your donors again it'll help you stand out in the crowd which is what we're what we're trying to do with our stewardship um public stewardship is you know listings naming them using uh name tags so we have both the personal and the public um, again, once someone passes, you may choose to light a candle at an event um, to, to remember them if they contributed to a campaign that you're, you're celebrating at the time. So donor events. Um, donors actually told Penelope Burke they like having events. You know, we all think, oh, they don't want to come to anything else. But sometimes they do like to come. But it's also sometimes as much about the the invitation, even if they don't come, but knowing, which is why I say you don't have to put together some totally new event, but just tack it on to something you're already doing. Um, because that way, if only half the people come, it's still a positive experience, right? So donors um, like those events. These are the things they told Penelope, that they like the opportunity to meet with staff and volunteers, who uh, they feel truly appreciated when they're invited to have that opportunity and they like it because they learn what the organization is doing and that events are especially memorable if they get to hear from someone who's benefited from the organization if there's an exceptional speaker or entertainment or if it's at a, an atypical venue someplace you know if you find a house where everybody wants to see the inside of the house then donors like to come to those events so uh, some, again, simple things that you can do, a cocktail reception before another program, an event that's not open to the general public, so a play at a religious school or a program at a camp, or a special um, gathering at the home of a donor where they get to hear from um, a beneficiary. And they don't have to be big events. You know, you can invite five couples to someone's house. It doesn't have to be a major, major event. Um, and this is just some examples of community recognition. So having an event and listing your donors in the program book or inviting people, this one from Arizona, it says they're going to recognize people at the event. So they let them know that you're, as a donor, you're going to be recognized at the annual meeting. This is hard to see, um, but this is from Penelope's book. 
Um, and what she's showing you here is that the stewardship that is more participatory is it has a greater impact on donors than just the ones that are passive. So thank you phone calls, events, and a photograph or a letter from someone helped by the cause, you can see have a, a greater impact on donors than just listing their names, right? So if you have to choose, if you're, if you have a capacity issue, then you'll want to choose those things that have the greater bang for their buck than gifts or plaques or um, just general list. So we're going to take a minute to turn to someone uh, near you again and uh, tell them the most important thing you think you've learned in the last half hour. <laughs> Yeah, I'm 
appreciation and recognition. Um, it's really making sure simple things like my name is spelled right or if I want to be called doctor, I'm called doctor, um, that you're using your money, the money you're receiving wisely and that you're working to further engage us. So fish and back office, um, you know, if somebody's passed away, make sure that you fix your database so the surviving spouse isn't getting mail with the deceased person uh, name on it, making sure your contributions are accurately input, making sure there's no spelling errors. Um, you know, if a gift's paid from a donor advice, but you're not supposed to put tax information on it, little, little things like that. Um, and also if somebody calls with a complaint or for information that they're responded to in a timely way, I'll get to you in a minute. I once went for a job interview at, um, and it was happened to be in a like a assisted living facility. And when I walked up to the receptionist, it didn't say receptionist on the desk. It didn't say her name. It said director of first impression, <laughs> because that is so true. Like whoever's walking in there, she was the first person that was setting the tone for what your experience is going to be with that organization. So. That's the other thing about stewardship. It's not just one or two people's responsibilities. It's the responsibility of everybody in the organization because every time a donor interacts with anybody, that's for a reflection on the organization. Yes? Regarding uh, the debt, it's so important to send a condolence card yes. to the family. Yes. It really makes an impact. Mm -hmm. That's, you're right. Um, again, making sure you're using your money, money wisely, that um, you're paying attention to your budget. If something happens that's unplanned for, that you address it, that you have um, financials available should somebody want to see them in an easily readable way. You don't have to necessarily send out the financials to everyone, but if someone asks for it, they should be able to receive it and understand it as well. Um, and then, you know, once you get to know me better, once you know what I'm interested, you know, further engage me, right? Ask me to speak about an experience I had at an event. Ask me to serve on a committee. Personally invite me to join you at an event or ask me to host an event, right? You want to do whatever you can to further engage me because that, the, first, the more engaged I am, the more likely I'm going to continue to give and to give at increasing amounts. Also, you want to stay in communication with me, right? So 
even if I'm a donor and I go to Florida for the winter, I need to be hearing from you. I don't want to just come back in spring and it's fundraising time again, right? So trying to communicate with donors, whether it's email or um, in print, whatever works for you, but just keeping um, in touch with people. Keeping communication short because none of us want to read long things anymore. Focus on what's being accomplished. Communicate news when it's news. If you have something that just happened that's really exciting, you know, if you have Facebook, put it out on Facebook or send out an email blast. People like to hear things when they happen. And then, as I said before, you want to appeal to both the intellectual and the emotional side of readers' brains, so sharing statistics and stories would help us. And then, you know, reporting back to me, right? There's lots of ways that you can report, whether it's an annual report or in a letter or in a newsletter um, at an actual meeting. Uh, Lynn Wester, who has a company called Donor Relations Guru, I've uh, talked a lot about stewardship, and she says 84% of donors say they would give more if they saw the results of their giving, and 77% of millennials said they would give more if they understood the impact of their gift. Yes? Um, just raises the question of communication. And, uh, and is, is there a difference in how we should communicate to my generation as opposed to the millennial generation? Yes, I'm not an expert on that, though I will tell you that more people in the over 60 category are on Facebook than any other generation. Um, and the most requested service in assisted living facilities now is access to high school web. Um, so many people will tell you print is still a very effective way of communicating with everybody. Um, but I think you, you know you have to be communicating on all channels. You know you have to be doing Facebook, you have to be doing print, you do email. I'm not the person to ask about Twitter. That's my daughter, but you know Twitter. Some people are doing that as well. That, that's the way you have to connect with people the way they're connecting, and now people are connecting in multiple ways. So let's finish up. We're going to take one, a few more minutes just to talk with the person next to you about one or two new stewardship activities that you feel you can integrate into your organizational culture. I mean, integrating stewardship is a culture change, right? It's something that's going to take time. You're not going to do it overnight. But if you could do one or two things this year and then think about one or two things you want to integrate into your culture next year, you'll slowly slowly make that change. So well, let's uh, do that and then we'll wrap up. So let's take a minute just to share what one or two things you think you're going to going to take away in your strategy, um, how do you keep a relationship, how do you bring the focus and kind of this thing. Okay, I'm going to go get the sheet. Okay, so
The other part of the word philanthropy comes from anthropos, which means humanity. Stewardship, defined in the dictionary, is the activity of a job of protecting and being responsible for something. So you see, when I put these two words together in a sentence, the person who comes to my mind is my friend Howard. Howard loved what he did in raising philanthropic dollars for the organizations that were important to sustain a Jewish community is how he started his day and how he ended his day. What Howard also realized is that in order to do this, he needed to be there for his donors too. Howard did not take the job of stewarding his donors lightly. He knew he needed to be empathetic, understanding, and not judgmental. He knew that it was not about him. Um, I do have one other little story, so bear with me. When I was in the kitchen this afternoon writing this, because I do my best work at the final hour, <laughs> or at least I should And Ari, my son, who's 25, happened to be in the kitchen, and he asked me what I was doing, and I said, well, you know, we have the Howard Day Single Program, and, you know, I have to write something because I'm closing up the program, and he says, well, what is it about? And I said, well, it's about um, stewardship and philanthropy. And he says, well, you know, you could just talk about Howard because, you know, Howard stewarded me. And I said, what do you mean? And he said to me, he said, well, Howard spent a lot of time going, with, going over all of his Yankee cards with me. And so he did it until he knew that I was happy. And I knew that Howard, you know, Ari was telling me that that's how happy. Howard just continued to do that until he knew that Ari was comfortable and happy and happy. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. We hope that the Howard J. Siegel Leadership Institute program provides value to you, not only at your organizations and at work, but also personally. If you have ideas for topics you would like to see in the future, please speak with me, Lois, or a staff member. This program would not have, would not have come together without the support of many people, Rachel, Heather, Jody, and I believe Karen Nichols. We have a new person. <laughs> no, she has not. Um, this program is brought to you by the Jewish Federation of Greater Hartford and the Jewish Leadership Academy. Funding is generously provided by Federation, and for those of you, I would want to be a <laughs> Evaluations that is being passed out. Your opinion is very helpful. We are always trying to bring a new 